You are listening to another No Fair Remembering Stuff, the Tuesday edition of the Professional Left Podcast, and available wherever you get your podcasts and at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a Patreon button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at the Professional Left Podcast, P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. And it's not safe for work. In this episode, we talk about a bygone and nearly forgotten age, the rise of the liberal blogs. Now, we realize that listening to old people sitting on the porch talking about the good old days can be really boring or come off as some kind of semi-mythical recollections that have been handed down the generations, like, say, the legends of Earth That Was in Firefly. But in this case, that past isn't bygone at all. It just seems that way because of the speed with which the immediate past is getting buried these days. In the story of the early days of liberal political blogging, it's really important to understand the context in which the story happens. For example, the first ever blogger is widely believed to be a guy named Justin Hall, who was a college undergrad in 1994 when he started a site called links.net. And the term blog is shorthand for weblog, which were originally diaries kept by people who wanted them available and shareable using the internet. It was a quick, inexpensive way of tossing off thoughts and letting your friends and colleagues know without clogging their email inboxes. Remember, 1994 was a full decade before Google released Gmail. And for a long time after that, Gmail was basically a lab experiment that was available by invitation only. If people used email at all, it was probably Yahoo, AOL, or Hotmail, and or some proprietary system used by their employers at work. Blogger, the platform that most of us ended up using, was a cool, glitchy little thing developed by Pyra Labs in late 1999. Pyra was bought out by Google in 2003, and Blogger got its first major facelift the next year, just in time for the liberal blogosphere to explode. Drift Class, do you remember when Blogger used to crash all the time? Oh, constantly. And <laughs> and and then it came along a thing called WordPress, and people would get get off of Blogger. WordPress is better, and you know there's some there's some truth to that. But yeah. There was there was a lot going on in Blogger that was real bad, including a thing called Hallow Scan, oh, which at Lord. some point we'll talk about, which was the comment uh, section, which was yeah. uh, a major innovation and certainly contributed to the sense of community. But it was a mess when it came to, you know, uh, by today's standards, it was just crazy. Yep. And to add one more data point, YouTube was founded in February of 2005, 18 years ago. All of my children are older than YouTube because youngest child was born in 2004. So, That's, yeah. Yeah, but she has no memory of a world without YouTube. Oh, no. None of no, them do. No. None of them can believe what? that That's you crazy. weren't able to take a video with your phone and put it up. And, and toss actually, it up somewhere, yeah. Actually, I think I've said this before, but the day that I knew that Barack Obama could be president was the day his campaign provided working embeddable video of his speech at Selma. Yeah. And when the embed worked, I went, oh. Oh, crap. Here <laughs> we go. This is the campaign we're dealing with. Yeah, And, and yeah. there were a lot of like sneaky little workarounds to things that didn't quite work, like getting video that you shouldn't probably have and sneaking it onto your site. Or <laughs> and, and I remember I have a whole toolkit of those things, including, uh, I'll just mention this in passing, I had a, I invented – a spam catcher. Yes, um, you did. Their early blogs, especially with comments, especially with comments that you couldn't really mediate. People would just show up there and dump whatever they wanted. Filled up with crappy ads for like dog stares, and it was. And I spent two very productive Saturdays writing up. Um, I think it was called uh, "Fear and Loathing on the Spam Pain Trail." Mm-hmm. I remember, and I, I remember. tracked 
tracked this entire spam um, uh, sprawl that was appearing all over the, all over the blogs, like to uh, warehouses in Russia, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. But it was it was go figure that Russia was experimenting yeah. with flooding the zone. But it was in, it was like two thousand three. Yeah, it was like yeah. herbal some herbal life guy was into it, and then there was a couple of servers that masked the people who were coming in. And you could trace them through, and I got written up in a couple of tech journals for doing that. But my my trick because it would just every new new post, the first five comments would be some insane online university or whatever. Um, I found out that if you made a very very small post, I had a very tiny little post at the very top of my blog. I, I just refreshed the date every day, so it was always the top one, uh, and that would sort of soak up all the spam because it thought that mm-hmm. was the first one all the time. And it, I have thousands of pieces of old spam in there from the old yeah. days. So if you ever want to buy a whole basket full of crappy old spam from like the, the early to mid two thousand for a dollar, for a dollar, <laughs> uh, as a matter of historical record, uh, but that's the way it was. It was it was the wild west, and um, and there was no way before YouTube for anybody to share anything on their own site or, or embedded on your own site, which I, right. you know, everyone just takes for granted now. Now, the granddaddy of liberal blogging, the actual, the, the portion of the blogger world that became liberal political blog was a thing called MyDD, which stood for My Due Diligence, believe it or not. And later it changed its name to My Direct Democracy. That was the first large collaborative progressive American political blog created by Jerome Armstrong in 2001. And think about this. Every important event in the history of the liberal blogosphere happened in the 21st century. Every, yeah. All of it. All of it had happened once the century had begun. Now, one of the early major contributors to MyDD was a young man named Marcos Melitzis. Uh, and he spun off his own blog. Might have heard of it. It was called The Daily Cause or Cause, I believe. <laughs> and that was, in, that was in 2002. And it really it took off like a rocket. And the first featured blogger on Daily Co's was my very own blog father, the late Steve Gilliard. Uh, and Marcos has credited him many times with uh, the success of Daily Co's during the early years with writers like Steve, uh, who in 2003 struck out on his own and set up his own site with his friend Jen called The News Blog. And Steve's site very quickly grew into one of the most popular blogs in the progressive blogosphere. Now, Steve's first news blog post in 2003, which I looked up, summed up his style like, like as follows. Quote, welcome to my new blog. If you've read me at Daily Coast and Net Slaves, then you know what to expect. If not, it's really simple. I say what I mean, and I mean what I say, unquote. That was it. The first time I personally, me, Drift Class, dipped my toe into the blogosphere was as a commenter at Steve's place. And we'll talk more about that later on, maybe in another episode. But for now, it's important to understand that the liberal or progressive or democratic mindset for this moment in history, understand where we were and what we were feeling at the time and why this all happened. The 2000 election, which was stolen by George Bush, and the way the Bush administration had ruthlessly exploited the 9-11 terrorist attacks to silence political opposition and reshape the government and bulldoze us into the Iraq war debacle, had shocked a lot of progressives. Now, people on the left, who had always been politically active, were only now beginning to clearly see that the Republican Party was not just wrong, but a grave and growing threat to democracy itself. Now, while there were tens of millions of us who were now very, very alarmed at what the Bush administration and the GOP was doing, If you had read newspapers or watched network or cable news at the time, you would never have known it. Remember that at this time, even liberal, quote unquote, MSNBC was all in on Bush and the Iraq war. For example, that countdown show that Keith Olbermann used to do on MSNBC and now does someplace else. I can't remember where he is. Is he? Doing He's countdown somewhere. someplace. Yeah, he is. I think so. Shout, shouting on the corner. I hear him every day shouting <laughs> on the corner. Yeah. He's got a podcast. Yeah. Uh, that show, Countdown, got its name because it was originally called Countdown Iraq, which, as the name implies, was built around counting down the days until the invasion of Iraq. In 2002, Pat Buchanan and Bill Press had a show on MSNBC. Yes, they did. And shortly after they both came out against the Iraq war, the show was canceled. 
In 2003, conservative lunatic Michael Savage Wiener had his own show on MSNBC. Failed Republican Congressman Joe Scarborough got his own MSNBC show, Scarborough Country, in 2003. Mm-hmm. Does anyone remember other programs in the MSNBC lineup from this period? Like, <laughs> I mean, this list. I, Jesse I Ventura's America. Alan Keyes is making sense. A- the Alan- si- Crazy ass Alan Keyes, the guy yeah. they pulled out of obscurity to run against Barack Obama for for, uh, for the Senate. Senate in Illinois, yeah. had his own show on MSNBC. The situation with Tucker Carlson. Tucker Carlson was on MSNBC. Got his start there. Got his yep. start there. Yeah. Connected coast to coast with Ron Reagan Jr. and the odious Monica Crowley mm-hmm. on MSNBC. Mm-hmm. A show called The Contributors that featured Ann Coulter and Laura Ingram on MSNBC. All of these shows actually happened. We're not yeah. making it up. Not like CNN was just as bad or worse. Fox News was much worse. And from coast to coast, the triumphant roar of Rush Limbaugh and all of his imitators filled the air. Yeah, this was this was what we were walking into. These are the headwinds we were facing. And if you ever want to see what actual cancel culture looks like, as opposed to the manufactured hysteria you hear all over conservative media and, of course, from very serious pundits. You don't need to look any further than the very well-organized systemic attack on the Dixie Chicks after they went and said 12 mean words about George W. Bush and the Iraq War on March 10th in 2003. Almost overnight, the Dixie Chicks were blacklisted by thousands of country radio stations the band members received death threats. Their single, Landslide, which was a Fleetwood Mac cover, fell from number 10 to 43 on the Billboard Hot 100 in one week and then fell off the charts completely the next week after that. The backlash also damaged sales of their next album and tour. In 2003, the American Red Cross refused a $1 million donation from the Dixie Chicks turned a million bucks down Uh because George W. Bush was the honorary chair of the Red Cross. And according to a Red Cross spokesperson, quote, the controversy made it impossible to associate with the Dixie Chicks, unquote. That's cancel culture. Yeah, that's actual cancel culture right there. Right there. Mm -hmm. There was some progressive radio out there in 2003, but very little. Air America launched in 2004. And they had some very good stuff. Rachel Maddow mm-hmm. got her start there, as did Ed Schultz. Some right. shows like the Tom Hartman program regularly pulled in more than a million listeners a week. But Air America was always on shaky ground and financially troubled and was never able to work out a syndication arrangement that would spread it much outside the liberal enclaves in major cities. They were completely overmatched in range and reach by conservative radio. And even in a city the size of Chicago, Air America reception could be iffy. And there was zero interest in bringing in local talent to complement their schedule. By March of 2003, the premier bastion of respectable, highbrow, conservative thought, the Weekly Standard, had become the Bush administration, respectable, highbrow, conservative propaganda arm. And they cranked out story after story celebrating how completely, absolutely right the right had been about everything. According to the Weekly Standard, the Iraq War was over. Bush had won an unconditional victory. And the most glorious part of this Marshall celebration was that it was now open season on liberals. Yep. From Stormfront and Limbaugh to George Will and David Brooks, all the knives came out for the left while the mainstream media dove for cover. Yeah, it was a very uncomfortable time to be not just a liberal, but be an outspoken liberal. Um, For example, in March of 2003, David Brooks, who you know I've documented extensively, and we've done many podcasts, a whole series of this podcast on David Brooks, published his most ambitious hit piece on the left, in which I think he avenged himself on pretty much every liberal who had ever slighted him since the fourth grade. It was ugly, and it was belligerent, and it was deeply personal, and it was grotesquely dishonest, and David Brooks was positively thrilled at the idea that all of us America-hating, terrorist-loving liberals would get owned so hard that we would never show our face in public again. And in September of 2003, Gail Collins 
rewarded David Brooks by offering one of the most prestigious jobs in journalism, senior conservative op-ed writer for the New York Times. You see, crime does pay kids. (laughs) In May of 2003, George W. Bush illegally turned a United States aircraft carrier, the USS Abraham Lincoln, and its entire crew into props for his campaign for re-election, and no one in the media cared. This was his now infamous mission accomplished stunt, and nowhere was Bush's stunt more drooled over than on MSNBC's Hardball with Chris Matthews. On the May 1st, 2003 edition of Hardball, Matthews was joined in his slobbering praise of Bush by right-wing monster Ann Coulter, the nominally Democratic Pat Cadell, and former Republican U.S. Representative B1 Bob Dornan. And Media Matters has a whole write-up of this, this entire episode, and I'm just going to read you the highlights that let you know exactly what Chris Matthews was wanting to tell America about George W. Bush. Matthews, the president's amazing display of leadership tonight, question mark. And that's the president looking very much like a, like a jet, you know, a high-flying jet star, a guy who's a jet pilot. He has been in the past when he was younger, obviously. The president deserves everything he's doing tonight in terms of his leadership. He won the war. He was an effective commander. Everybody recognizes that, I believe, except a few critics. And you know who he was talking about. Matthews again. Let me ask you, Bob Dornan. You were a congressman all those years. Here's a president who's really nonverbal. He's like Eisenhower. He looks great in a military uniform. He looks great in that cowboy costume he wears when he goes west. Matthews again. Ann Coulter, you're the first to speak tonight on The Buzz. The president's performance tonight, redolent of the best of Reagan. What do you think? I mean, with an introduction like that, what's she going to say? Ann Coulter said, it's stunning. It's amazing. I think it's huge. I mean, he's landing on a boat at 150 miles per hour. It's tremendous. It's hard to imagine any Democrat being able to do that. And it doesn't matter if Democrats try to ridicule it. It's stunning, and it speaks for itself. Pat Cadell pipes in a few minutes later. It sounded like the kind of PR stunt that Bill Clinton would pull. But, and then I saw it. And you know, there's a real, there's a real affection between him and the troops. Matthews again, the president there, look at this guy. We're watching him. He looks like he flew the plane. He only flew it as a passenger, but he's flown. Matthews again, he looks for real. What is it about the commander-in-chief role, the hat, that he does wear that makes him, I mean, seems he seems like he didn't fight in a war, but he looks like he does. Matthews again, look at this guy. Pat Cadell, it's a quality. It's an innate quality. It's a real quality. Chris Matthews, I know. I think you're right. Later that day on MSNBC's Countdown with Keith Olbermann, Matthews said, We're proud of our president. Americans love having a guy as president, a guy who has a little swagger, who's physical, who's not a complicated guy. Women like a guy who's president. Check it out. The women like this war. I think we like having a hero as our president. Yeah. This was the state of liberal media in 2004. Mm Mm-hmm. And this quote from the late Hunter Thompson pretty much summed up what all of us on the left were seeing on TV. Quote, did you see Bush on TV trying to debate? Jesus, he talked like a donkey with no brains at all. The tide turned early in Coral Gables when Bush went belly up less than halfway through his first bout with Kerry, who hammered poor George into jelly. It was pitiful. I almost felt sorry for him until I heard someone call him Mr. President, and then I felt ashamed, unquote. We watched as thugs like Jerome Corsi and his swift boat mob rolled over the compliant national media. We watched the smirking assholes at the Republican National Convention sporting their little band-aids with their little purple hearts drawn on them. And we watched as the RNC gave the keynote stage to the senior Democratic senator from Georgia, Zell Miller, so that he could very publicly knife John Kerry in the back. And for your listening pleasure, here are a few quotes from that speech. Quote, At the same time, young Americans are dying in the sands of Iraq and the mountains of Afghanistan. Our nation is being torn apart and made weaker because of the Democrats' manic obsession to bring down 
our commander in chief's party. Quote, but don't waste your breath telling that to the leaders of my party today. In their warped way of thinking, America is the problem, not the solution. Quote, Senator Kerry made it clear that he would use military force only if approved by the United Nations. Kerry would let Paris decide what America needs defending. I want Bush to decide. This Democratic senator yelled about Democrat agitators and flag burners to a Republican crowd that screamed its approval. But even as 2003 turned into 2004, most of us were still hopeful that the country would not, could not possibly reelect this dry, drunk idiot who had stolen the 2000 election, slept through the worst terrorist attack in American history, and now had exploited that attack to ram through his radical domestic political agenda and had lied us into the wrong war. Now, the first big flex of the progressive net roots, that's us, was in the Howard Dean campaign of 2004. The net roots at that time showed what kind of clout an online activist community could bring to bear. It was largely responsible for elevating Dean to Democratic frontrunner based largely on his opposition to the Iraq war. And it showed it could raise a serious amount of money and provide an army of energetic and engaged volunteers. Now the Dean campaign ended pretty abruptly because the mainstream media effectively killed that campaign by dogpiling him over one shout to a rally at the crowd at a political event. But we still thought the majority of Americans could not possibly choose a mushmouth fraud and war criminal like Bush over an actual war hero like John Kerry. And that's around the time that Karl Rove and Matthew Dowd went to work. Yeah, yep. You might only know Matthew Dowd as a near constant presence on today's MSNBC, especially on his fellow Bush administration veteran Nicole Wallace's show, where he routinely tisk tisks both sides do it journalism as toxic and wrong. Or you might know him as the chief political analyst for ABC News, where he and his pal Ron Fournier were the undisputed kings of toxic, both sides do it journalism during the entire 2016 campaign. You know, the corrupt duopoly. Yeah, that, that, this whole, this episode is, I, I harp on it on my own blog. I've stopped doing it nearly as much as I used to. But the fact that Matthew Dow could just wipe his past away and pretend mm -hmm. it never happened and block anyone who mentions it and fucking get away with it. Uh, with well, the and he got of... away with a lot more than that because yes, you, did. You, you might not know that before all of that, Dowd was the ruthless scumbag behind Bush's 2004 re-election campaign. Mm -hmm. His strategy was to convert the already constantly boiling rage, paranoia, homophobia, and other, quote, anger points, unquote, of the GOP base into enough votes to put Bush back into office. This is from a 2007 Salon article entitled Matthew Dowd's Not-So-Miraculous Conversion. Quote, by 2004, relying on Dowd's numbers, Republicans made gay marriage the most salient social issue, exceeding abortion and gun control in, it, in its inflammatory potential to mobilize conservatives. Dowd prescribed the strategy for targeting republican base voters' anger points as GOP consultants called them, for maximum turnout. The war on terror was the glue that held the Bush message together. In the political rinse cycle, Dowd transformed the disinformation justifying the Iraq war into platitudinous Republican talking points. In the interviews he granted, Dowd repeated them effortlessly. Events in Iraq, he told National Public Radio during the Republican convention in September 2004, and removing Saddam Hussein from, is all part of the war on terror. You can't separate out removing a brutal dictator from a place that harbored terrorists from the war on terror. So he was just gluing what? together 9-11 yeah. and Saddam Hussein when they had nothing to do with each other. Dowd packaged his vicious tactics as nothing more than the application of basic advertising technique. This is still from Salon. His slicing and dicing of wedge issues was no such thing, he explained. He was, he said, just creating a new Republican brand. After Rove executed Dowd's carefully calculated targeting to produce Bush's narrow victory in 2004, Dowd was triumphant. He said, issues don't matter in a presidential campaign. 
It's your brand values that matter. For Dowd, facts didn't matter either, only brand identity, unquote. Dowd and Karl Rove made sure that anywhere the numbers were close, a virulently anti-gay marriage referendum was on the ballot. So while some conservative evangelicals might not have made it to the polls to vote for George Bush, they would all turn out to bash the sodomites. And so we watched on election night as Bush won by a narrow margin of 35 electoral votes and took 50.7% of the popular vote and returned to office declaring a huge mandate. Got a huge mandate. You do whatever he wants. Um, And if you weren't there, if you didn't live through this, just take our word for it that the only thing this can be compared to, um, the growing sense of dread, followed by uh, stunned, everything's falling apart feeling that we all went through with the re-election of George Bush was the dread, stunned, everything fall apart feeling we all went through with the election of Donald Trump in 2016. Um, The realization that there really are enough bigots and imbeciles and homophobes and lunatics in this country to elect manifestly unfit monsters to the highest office in the land over and over again. And not just that, they're proud of what they've done. They want to make liberals cry. They want to destroy everything we cherish. We also realized that the conservative propaganda they'd been wallowing in for decades had poisoned them, destroyed them beyond recovery. There was no reaching these people anymore. And that the mainstream media was now so broken and so cowed and so complicit, there was no point in looking for salvation there. This was the moment when existential political crisis and technology and activism all collided and the net roots really took off. Now, one of my favorite sites, which I contribute to every now and then, is called Crooks and Liars, and they launched in the fall of 2004 and received the Best Video Blog Award in the Weblog Awards in 2006 and a Best Weblog About Politics in the 2008 Weblog Awards. Time Magazine listed Crooks and Liars as one of the 25 best blogs in 2009. In 2010, Crooks and Liars content was featured by New York Magazine's Intelligencer, and a 2011 study in journalism included Crooks and Liars in a list of the 12 most popular partisan blogs. The site's founder, who also happens to be Blue Gal's employer, John Amato, said he started the site because, quote, he thought the mainstream media wasn't critical enough of the Bush administration, and he felt motivated to speak out. He also mastered a way to put video on a blog before YouTube. Before and that was, made him very, very popular. It, yeah. it, everybody, I watched a, 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 a documentary a night ago or two called Blog Wars. It's from that period. And people were, first of all, John Amato's in it, which is amazing. Uh, it's on Vimeo if anybody wants to see it. But people were always reaching out to him for video. Right. So-and-so has a copy of this. They have a, a video cassette of it. Get it over to John and he'll make it into a video and then we can all use it. It was part of the community. Yep. Let's talk for a minute about the redoubtable Digby. She started her blog in January of 2003, and this is from her very first post. Quote, Okay, there's no point in putting it off. My New Year resolution is to go ahead and start this up and let the chips fall where they may. Knowing myself, it is entirely possible that I will lose interest in it within a matter of days and will slink (laughs) off into even more obscurity than that in which I already happily exist, unquote. And of course, 20 years later, she's still blogging. Mm -hmm. In her first week, Digby was writing about now familiar subjects, including Peggy Noonan's pearl-clutching hypocrisy. Quote, how inspiring, but I'm a little bit confused about one little thing, and I sure wish Peggy would take the time to explain it. If Peggy felt so strongly about this topic, if she's been indignant for a long time, If Trent Lott represented the last gasping breath of Jim Crow, then I would really like to know where in the hell she got off tendentiously lecturing Democrats like her hero Harold Ickes about how they had lost their souls because a few people in a crowd of 20,000 booed this despicable racist bastard at a tribute for a guy whose entire life was about social justice, Paul Wellstone. Seriously, I just hope she can live with herself for turning the pain and anguish in the Wellstone family into a cheap political talking point. I hope she will find it in herself to examine how she could use a totally righteous display of disgust at a man like Trent Lott, who stood for everything that Paul Wellstone fought against in his life. 
into a campaign strategy that deigned to lecture Democrats about the goodness of the man, she demanded the leadership of her party, quote, brutally, unquote, fire less than two months later. Yep, 20 years later, Digby is still blogging, and Peggy Noonan still has a job for life at the Wall Street Journal. Yeah, a lot of this is was kind of depressing to revisit. <laughs> <clears throat> um, but, you know, this is, this is our history. This is how we got to where we are now. Now, my own blog father, the late Steve Gilliard, started his own site in 2003. Both Digby and Steve quickly became two of the most muscular and respected liberal voices in the blogging world. And what Digby said became a blogger catchphrase that everybody understood. And one of the most surprising and delightful developments of this online community, where most people use a pseudonym and the only judge of quality was the strength and consistency of your words, was to find out that, oh my God, two of the heaviest hitters in liberal blogging were a white woman from California and a black man from New York. Now, this is an excerpt from Steve in December of 2003 from a post that a lot of you might know called I'm a Fighting Liberal. It's not the whole thing because it's very long, but here's a few excerpts to give you a flavor for it. You know, I've studied history. I've read about America, and you know something? If it weren't for liberals, we'd be living in a dark, evil country far worse than anything Bush could conjure up. A world where children were told to piss on the side of the road because they aren't fit to pee in a white outhouse, where women had to get back alley abortions and where rape was a joke unless the alleged criminal was black, whereupon he was hung from a tree and castrated. What has conservatism given America? A stable social order? A peaceful home life? Respect for law and order? No. Hell no. It hasn't given us anything we didn't have already, and it wants to take away our freedoms. Conservatism plays on fear and thrives on lies and dishonesty. I grew up with honest, decent conservatives, and those people have been replaced by the party of greed. For the better part of a decade, the conservatives made liberal a dirty word. Well, it isn't. It represents the best and most noble nature of what America stands for. Equitable government services, old age pensions, health care, education, fair trials, and humane imprisonment. It is the heart and soul of what made America different and better than other countries. Not only an escape from oppression, but the opportunity to thrive in a land free of tradition and the repression that can bring. We offered a democracy which didn't enshrine the rich and made them feel like they had an obligation to their workers. It's time to regain the spirit of FDR and Truman and the people around them, people who believed in the public good over private gain, it's time to stop apologizing for being a liberal and be proud to fight for your beliefs. No more shying away or being defined by other people. Liberals believe in a strong defense and punishment for crime, but not preemption and pointless jail sentences. We believe no American should be turned away from a hospital because they're too poor or lack proper legal defense. We believe that people should make enough from one job to live on, to spend time raising their family. We believe that individuals, not the state, should dictate who gets married and why. The best way to defend marriage is to expand it, not restrict it. Without liberals, there would be no modern America, just a Nazi satellite state. Liberals weak on defense? Liberals created American defense. The conservatives only need vets at election time. It's time to stop looking for an accommodation with the right. They want none from us. They want to win at any price. So you have a choice. Be a fighting liberal or sit quietly. I know what I am. What are you? Unquote. Let's close this episode with another quote from Digby. In January of 2003, Digby was also writing about why the GOP propaganda machine was so effective and why Democrats were failing to counter it. And 20 years later, her advice is still as fresh and topical as it was then. Quote, the common wisdom is that Democrats don't do well in talk radio or cable news formats because we don't have the right combative style. We're too dry and boring. The New York Times article says that we talk down to people. This may be true, but it's really a much deeper problem than that. The reason we've been stymied is because we have been clinging to the idea that political media should reflect a rational discourse in which views are aired and debated with civility and mutual respect, and that commercial entertainment values are inappropriate and dangerous to democracy. 
I agree. The problem is that ship has sailed. While we were standing on the dock, talking amongst ourselves and patting each other on the back for our fealty to reason. It's over. Political journalism is now part of the entertainment media, at least on television and radio. And we are foolish if we don't recognize it and get on with it. If there were a great disaffected audience of rational thinkers who just want to be informed, then Jim Lehrer would have the highest rated news show on television. He isn't even close. The fact is that people want the news to entertain them. In fact, they demand it. The Democrats need to be open to radically new ideas about how to sell politics. Because whether we like it or not, it's another media product competing in a 500-channel universe for the attention of an overstimulated populace. Liberals have to use our dominance in the world of art, communications, and entertainment to translate what is already a liberal cultural environment into a liberal political environment, unquote. Wow. Yeah, wow. 20 years wow. ago. Yeah. yeah, 20 years ago she said that. What Digby touched on here is the trap that the mainstream media still lays for Democrats and that some Democrats are still falling into 20 years later. So if you want to know what happened next, including how Blue Gal and I began our blogs and eventually created a marriage-based media empire, make sure to (laughs) tune... I know. Sorry. Now you made me laugh. Make sure to tune in to our next episode of No Fair Remembering Stuff, which is a production of The Professional Left. See you next time. See you next time. The Professional Left Podcast, No Fair Remembering Stuff Tuesday edition, is produced under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2022-23, DGBG Productions.